Welcome. This is a new recording of the January 26th webinar, New Year and New Vaccines Bring Hope and Promise. We are providing this new recording due to the technical difficulties experienced on that day. We have updated some of our information given that a week has passed. My name is Katie Ramos and I am the Administrative Services Manager for Goodwin House at Home. It is my pleasure to introduce your program moderator, Sue Dalton, Director of Sales at Goodwin House Incorporated. Thanks, Katie. Thank you for joining us today, all of you who are participating in our webinar. Today, we're, you're going to gain insights on the new COVID-19 vaccine and what Goodwin House is doing to prepare everyone in our family for the future. I'm not only the director of sales at Goodwin House, I'm also a daughter of a Goodwin House Alexandria resident, and you can see me pictured with my mom, Bev, here. As a daughter, I have seen firsthand the enjoyment that residents are receiving currently from outdoor concerts, Tai Chi classes, fitness classes, and small gatherings with friends, and the many other activities that are taking place regularly here. And everyone in my family has peace of mind knowing that my mom has made a plan for her future that includes Goodwin House's high quality health care should she need it. Also, she's about to receive her second vaccine, and this is a huge relief to all of us. Our program today is in two parts. First, Lindsay Hutter, Chief Strategy and Marketing Officer, will share an overview of Goodwin House's approach to safety while keeping residents and members engaged throughout the pandemic and our plans to assist residents to rebound as we return to our new normal. Then, Dr. Maggie Gloria, Medical Director for Goodwin House Hospice and Palliative Care, will provide the clinical view of where we are with the pandemic and what's next. Before we move too much further into our webinar, we do have a few housekeeping notes. You will see the PowerPoint slides and our featured experts on your computer screen. You may want to adjust the volume on your computer if you're having trouble hearing me or our speakers. We've allowed time at the end of our presentation for questions and answers, and we do thank many of you who submitted questions ahead of time. Let me just take a minute to explain how you can pose questions during the webinar with a chat feature. Feel free to enter a question uh, using your question pane during the webinar. This slide provides visual instructions on how to do that. I'll give you a minute to review it. While we will be speaking of the Goodwin House Life Plan communities today, it's important to note that Goodwin House also serves older adults who wish to age in place through our Goodwin House at Home program. Some Goodwin House at Home members have made a seamless transition to a life plan community with the assistance of their Goodwin House at Home team. As a mission-driven organization, Goodwin House also manages the Lewinsville retirement residence for older adults requiring financial assistance. No matter where you choose to live, Goodwin House provides healthcare services such as physical therapy through Goodwin House Home Health and compassionate care through Goodwin House Palliative Care and Hospice. So let's just take a minute to review the topics that we're going to cover over the next hour. Our first speaker is Lindsay Hutter, who will review how we supported Goodwin House residents, members, and our community throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Then Dr. Maggie Gloria will provide our COVID-19 update. We will conclude with an opportunity for you to ask questions of our speakers. And so now it's my great pleasure to introduce Lindsay Hutter, Chief Strategy and Marketing Officer. Lindsay? Thank you so much, Sue. It's a pleasure to be with you and everyone today. And just as it's a family affair for Sue, it's also a family affair for me in terms of serving Goodwin House, our residents are Goodwin House at Home members and working alongside my colleagues. What you see on this photo is my mother, Wanda Hutter, a resident of Goodwin House Alexandria 
And that's the day she received her first dose of the COVID vaccine. And then that's me, like mother, like daughter. And that was the day I received my first dose. It is very personal for us, whether we have family members that are residents or not. And that's because Goodwin House is like a family and we care for one another in good times and bad. And we're always there for one another. So I share that because as you're thinking about your future, you want to know what's the culture of an organization that you might entrust with your next season of life. And so this is just a window into the Goodwin House family. I'm going to take a step back now with this next slide and show you a quote from an analyst firm that studies the field of senior living. And in particular, they've been studying the field of senior living as it's weathered the pandemic. I want to read this quote to you from this Marcus and Millichamp special report on seniors housing. The pandemic will leave a lasting impact on daily operations, safety protocols, and community design. The well being of residents and frontline staff remain the top priority of operators, many of which are fatigued by budgetary pressures, workforce shortages, and limitations to social interactions. So, why did I think this slide was important? Back to your homework of exploring senior living communities, particularly because of the impact of the pandemic, we think it's very important that you consider four factors about any community that you learn about. The first, how well are they protecting those they serve? The second factor, how well are they protecting those who serve? This is very significant because the field of senior living entered the pandemic with a significant shortfall of workers. And we will exit the pandemic with an even greater shortfall of workers. So you're going to want to know how strong is employee retention and recruitment for organizations that you consider. The third factor, what is the financial resilience and strength of the organization? And fourth, what is the culture of that organization? So let me now advance and tell you a little bit about our approach to the pandemic. And this is where you can think about our culture of community service. You can think about our resilience and strength as an organization and how quickly we were to respond to the threat of the pandemic. I'll focus on three things with this slide. Leadership focus, our proactive approach, and our mission mindset. With respect to the leadership focus, it's important that you know that the senior leadership of Goodwin House has been dedicated to protecting our residents, our members, our staff since the pandemic began. We formed what we call the Infection Precaution and Planning Team in February of 2020. It meets daily to address the situation and is very involved in all of the details. Proactive approach, that's what you see in the middle column. We were one of the first senior living organizations to make a decision to proactively start testing our residents and our staff for the coronavirus. That was back in May. We didn't do it because the government said we had to do it. We didn't do it because the state of Virginia brought the National Guard in. We did it because we said, we wanna catch those asymptomatic cases before they could possibly spread in our organization. And to this day, we continue to test out of an abundance of precaution for our residents and our staff members. And third, in the right-hand column, you see mission mindset. Goodwin House was one of the first organizations to initiate a group buy back in April when healthcare organizations, hospital systems, and other senior living organizations could not obtain personal protective equipment. We realized that if we went on the global market with a very large buy, we could probably get the PPE. And we did. Over 60 different organizations participated in that group buy. We also published a playbook at the end of this past summer with all of the lessons learned, the protocols, templates for everything that we had developed to keep our residents and our staff safe. We wanted to share that in schools, with churches, with other senior living organizations to help everyone be as safe as they could be and resume their operations. We fundamentally believe we are stronger together as an organization. So as we shift to the next slide, what we're going to show you is another philosophy of being proactive. We moved very quickly to work with the Commonwealth of Virginia and CDS to bring vaccine clinics into our organizations. Our first vaccine clinics were the 29th and the 30th of December. 
And this brief video shows you the energy that was felt as we were able to vaccinate our residents and our staff. For now, I want to talk about the lessons that we've learned being on the front line of the pandemic for nearly one year. And these are lessons that will help us take advantage of what we've learned and create even stronger and healthier environments for those we serve. First one, infection precaution. We've already implemented new technologies. So when our residents come back to the community, when our staff come into the community, when visitors come into the community, we've got biometric automated screening machines. Those ask a series of questions just to make sure no one's had a potential exposure or has any symptoms. It also automatically takes your temperature. So we don't want to put aside those infection precaution measures. We actually want to be smart and retain them to keep any type of virus from coming into our communities as we go forward. In the middle column here, you see environmental practices. Tremendous new technologies that exist today to help keep public spaces much, much safer. What are those? Well, they're ultraviolet machines. We purchased several, they're called Solaris machines. They do an incredibly deep cleaning of any room or area. And so we've got the Solaris machines that we move about our campuses 24 seven. We also have new air filter systems, which help keep the air safe. So you see, we've already made significant investments in environmental practices that we're going to continue into the future. And then in the right-hand column, you see telehealth. We've begun leveraging technology to deliver higher levels of care remotely. And that's a wonderful thing because if it's really cold weather as it's been the last few days, wouldn't it be better if a resident needs some medical oversight to be able to do that by telehealth, if that's possible? rather than go out in the cold, rather than risk the ice, we're investing in more telehealth with our medical partners so we can deliver new innovative ways to help our residents stay healthy and stay safe. So as we flip to the next slide, we're going to talk about life after the pandemic. If you think about the last year and just think about it in your own life, what's changed? An awful lot has changed. Now, we approach life after the pandemic, we call it rebounding well. We approach it with an awareness that older adults have tremendous resilience, actually remarkable. And there's so much that you can teach us about being resilient because you've weathered so much in your life that you've, you've earned being the masters of resilience. And yet for all of us, the pandemic has taken a toll. Regardless of our age, we will all benefit from being intentional about rebounding well. Goodwin House is now underway on developing a program we're calling Rebounding Well. And the goal is to help older adults that are part of the Goodwin House family be intentional about assessing their health factors and taking steps to bridge gaps. Over these next two slides, I will share with you why we're doing this and the health factors we're focused on. So the first one is physical. Think about the effects of the pandemic on our lives and now winter and winter storms. So when the weather starts to warm up, we may wanna jump outdoors at the first chance, but our bodies may not be quite as ready. They may be a little stiff, may not be as agile, they may not be as mobile because we just haven't been moving as much. 
We've already started to put resources online with our fitness experts, webinars, fitness classes that you can participate in. So rebounding well will focus a lot on how do we make sure that our bodies are ready to rebound well. Number two, social. More than half of older adults, 50 and older, participating in a recent AARP survey reported social isolation, which is defined as an absence of meaningful social relationships during the pandemic. And among these participants, women struggled the most with almost three in 10 reporting they had gone one to three months without interacting with people outside of their household or their workplace. AARP tapped into the knowledge of astronaut Scott Kelly. He spent 340 days in space and working with AARP, he's been able to shed some light on the impact of social isolation. Now, while astronauts in space, NASA provides support and counseling for them, Kelly says. But the AARP survey shows that many people who feel isolated do not know of resources or don't take advantage of available resources. Only 11% of the survey respondents turned to a medical professional when they were feeling sad or down. And almost a third of those who were 50 or over said they didn't turn to anyone during the pandemic when they were experiencing social isolation. Kelly said this, when I was in space for a year, not only was help available to me, it was mandatory. Our mission today is to make sure that all older adults know of the resources that are available to them if they have been experiencing social isolation. We'll cover that in our Rebounding Well program. And let me now tackle immunity. Recent study by Emergency Health Products found that while many Americans are taking precautionary measures due to the pandemic, their overall well being has suffered. As a result of the pandemic, 48% of Americans say they are stressed more often, 42% report they are eating less healthy, and 30% say they are sleeping worse. Now, what do these three factors do? They depress our immune system. So immunity is probably one of those quiet, almost invisible factors that we want to start to measure in ourselves so we can rebound well from this pandemic and take steps to help us bridge and rebuild our immunity. As we shift to the next slide, we're gonna focus on medical factors. One of the big concerns that many of us have who care for older adults is that while taking those infection precaution measures and not going to their doctor's office, they've missed a lot of important routine medical appointments. So if you have any hesitation about going to your doctor's office, call, ask them to explain what their infection precaution measures are so you can get some insurance that you will be safe going to those important medical checkups and regular appointments. It's particularly important just to monitor your health, but also for any med medicine reconciliation. And finally, one of the other aspects of rebounding well that we will address is mental. Ongoing study by the National Social Life Health and Aging Project, led by the National Opinion Research Corporation, tracks the physical and emotional well-being of older adults over time. Only 9% of older adults reported having fair or poor mental health during the pandemic. Now that's similar to their previous answers and an indication of what the study calls signs of resilience. Back to my earlier point that older adults are incredibly resilient. Nevertheless, the study found that general happiness has declined during the pandemic. About half as many older adults now report that they are very happy or extremely happy as they did previously. And there's been an increasing number of older adults reporting feelings of depression or isolation. And this is a quote from one of the researchers. It should sensitize everyone to the reality of isolation's impact, but also the reality that people are resilient and maybe even more so older adults than younger adults. Now, why would that be? That same researcher said, this isn't their first show. They've been through things before. They know how to handle stress. And this is something we can learn from them, that there is survival. 
Still, we encourage everyone, older adults, younger adults, to pay attention to their mental health and their cognitive health. If you have any concerns at all, we encourage you to re reach out to your primary care physician. Now, the last thing I want to cover is vaccine options. That's been a question that many of our prospects, many of our priority club members have asked us. Over the last month and a week, it's been a bit bumpy in terms of the options for vaccinations. A number of senior living organizations have been able to obtain vaccinations for their residents and their staffs, as we have at Goodwin House. Initially, local hospital systems were offering the vaccine, and then they pulled away from that about two weeks ago when the state of Virginia wanted to make a change in the approach that it was going to offer for vaccinations. And the state said, we want to focus on vaccine, vaccine distribution in coordination with local health departments. So that's starting to resolve itself. We encourage you to follow your local health department, visit your local health department's websites, whether that's a county health department or a city health department, because that's where you're gonna find the most current information on options to obtain the vaccine. And of course that's pending which group you're in, whether that's 1B or 1C. We have been able to obtain the vaccine for our Goodwin House at Home members and for those members of the Priority Club that are planning to move into one of our life plan communities soon. We've advocated for the opportunity to vaccinate Priority Club members that may be two years or three years out from moving into one of our communities, but thus far, the state of Virginia has not supported us in this effort, but I promise you, we will keep trying. So that concludes my comments for this morning, and I look forward to answering your questions shortly. Thank you, Sue. Lindsay, thank you so much for that summary of our approach and the lessons that we've learned throughout the pandemic. It is so nice to hear about what's next and to know that the Goodman House team is thinking about how we can best help residents and members rebound to a more normal sense of well-being. If you have participated in any of our previous COVID-19 webinars, you are familiar with our friend, Dr. Maggie Gloria, who is our source of the latest information and someone our team looks to as a calming influence. Dr. Gloria completed her fellowship training in hospice and palliative medicine, as well as internal medicine at George Washington University. She is board certified in internal medicine and hospice and palliative medicine by the American Board of Internal Medicine. Prior to joining Goodwin House, Dr. Gloria served on the inpatient palliative care team to George Washington University Hospital. Welcome to you, Dr. Gloria. Thank you so much, Suze, for the lovely introduction and welcome everyone. I'm so glad that you could join us again today for another webinar. Um, so to get us started, I'm gonna start where I always start and that is with a review of the state of the pandemic uh, in the US. So globally, just to kind of back up for a moment, there have been more than 100 million cases of uh, COVID-19 reported. There have been over 2.2 million deaths. Here in the United States, we've had just over 26 million cases of COVID-19 reported with just over 440,000 deaths. So this graphic is one that we've looked at many times. It shows the uh, number of cases reported each day in the United States as a whole. That dark red line on the top again um, demonstrates the seven day rolling average of cases. And so that's a good way to look at the trend in the data and not just the day-to-day -day fluctuations. So this graphic is the same that we used during our presentation on the 26th. Not much has changed. That curve continues to trend down, which is great news. Um, and then if we look at the uh, map on the right hand side, there we go. We've looked at this many times before. Um, again, today's map looks very similar to this. Uh, we are still seeing areas in Southern California, Arizona, and then along the uh, East Coast in the Carolinas, the color is getting lighter. So cases are getting fewer, which is great. Again, if you remember this map, um, denotes by color where they're seeing a lot of cases in the darker colors versus where there are reporting less cases in the lighter colors. So we want to see those lighter colors. It looks like all in all nationwide we're um, on a good trend, a good downward trend. If we look at the next slide, we're going to look at just the state of Virginia. 
Um, so again, reflecting kind of what we're doing in the United States, um, when we did this recording the first time on the 26th, uh, there were 4,607 cases reported in the state of Virginia that day. And then today, so far, there's 3,865. Yesterday, there were 4,146. So I'm tossing a whole bunch of numbers at you. Um, the point is that the cases are going down and we're loving seeing it. If you look at the graph, again, the dark yellow line represents the average uh, number of cases over the seven days. And you can see that that line is starting to dip back down again. So very good news. If we look at the next slide, we'll look at just the Northern Virginia area. We've, we've looked at this again in previous uh, webinars. Uh, doing still very well in the Northern Virginia area. We had that little blip mid-January-ish, but um, we are also continuing to trend downward. If we look at the state as a whole, so the next graph that's gonna pop up on your right-hand side is the whole rest of the state, not including us here in the Northern Virginia area. Um, they had a much bigger spike um, out around from December through mid-January. They're also on the downward um, trend though. So good news all around. So speaking of news, let's go to the next slide. We're gonna talk a little bit about um, a couple of headlines that have been in the news lately about these new strains of, of COVID-19. So we knew this was coming. Nobody in the scientific community is surprised. Uh, this is what viruses do, they mutate. That's why we have a flu vaccine every year. Um, I think we were all hoping that it took a little bit longer, but unfortunately these new strains are here. The first new strain of COVID-19 was identified in the UK in early November, and it was, it's estimated to be 30 to 70% more contagious than the original strains. Um, so if you look at the first headline here, they're in Denmark, they sequence every single COVID-19 sample that they get, which is really nice because it gives them a lot of data about exactly which strains they're seeing and which they're not. So looking at that data, uh, and this is the UK strain, by the way, that they're looking at. So it's the B117 strain. Uh, they're thinking that that could be the dominant strain uh, in their country in Denmark by early February. And by early April, the, the average number of cases reported each day is expected to quadruple. So when we say it is 30 to 70 percent more contagious, that's kind of what that looks like. Um, there have been a couple other strains reported, uh, one reported in South Africa, that's variant B1351, um, and that was first detected in October. Um, apparently, that has a mutation in the spike, muta the spike uh, protein, which is the exact protein that the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines target. So, of course, there's a lot of concern in the medical community that those vaccines are uh, not going to be as efficient uh, toward these new strains. There's an, yet another strain that uh, was first seen in Brazil, and that one is uh, P1, basically. Um, it's very similar to the South African variant. So Moderna and Pfizer are currently working on not just rolling out a booster vaccine that would work better toward these new strains, but they're also working with uh, regulatory agencies to try and make sure that they can get authorization to use this new vaccine since it's only a booster to the one that they've already studied. Um, but they're currently working on that. If we go to the next slide, I threw in uh, the address, the web address for the CDC page, which is monitoring these new strains in the United States and their spread. So if you look down at the bottom, there is the web page. It's uh, www.cdc.gov backslash coronavirus, and it goes on to uh, give you the rest of the address. So in your free time, if you have a copy of the slides, you can certainly go to this web page if you'd like. This map is linked from the web page, and so it's interactive. You can scroll over and see for each state how many cases of each new variant that I just mentioned, the three from the UK, South Africa, or Brazil, uh, have been reported. If you roll over Virginia today, there have been two strains so far identified of the UK variant in Virginia, okay? All three strains at this point within the last week have been reported at somewhere in the United States, one place or another. All right, so. I mentioned vaccines, and uh, and so let's talk a little bit about the vaccine rollout and how that's going. Um, to date, 20 million Americans have received either the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine, so that's just about 7% of the population. 20 million is a lot of people, but you know we're working toward having 70 to 80% of the population vaccinated before we can reach herd immunity, so we're not quite there yet. Uh, but so far of the 20 million people that have been vaccinated, the vaccine has proven to be safe. There have been very few anaphylactic uh, reactions to the vaccine and the number has been on par with that of the flu vaccine. So you, again, I've 
mentioned in previous um, webinars, you can have an allergic reaction like that to any medication or vaccine. And so the COVID-19 vaccine doesn't seem to be any more um, dangerous in that sense than any of the others that we, that we work with. If you look at the slide in front of you, this is a screenshot from the Virginia Department of Health. Like Lindsay mentioned, it is really a good idea to make sure that you're checking with your local health department as these vaccines roll out, as they start to change gears and change you know, how the vaccine rollout is going. I know that's been bumpy for all of us, but keeping in touch with your local health department is the best way to, to keep up. So again, the web address for this page is listed at the bottom of the slide. It's www.vdh.virginia.gov. And then if you look particularly at this slide on the left hand um, bottom corner, there is a dark blue round button that says find out which phase your county or city is in. If you click on that, um, you can put in your address and it'll tell you exactly which phase you're in. And you can also find out if you're eligible, again, making sure that you're keeping up with what's going on with your local health department. Um, all of the health departments in our area, so Arlington, Alexandria, um, and Fairfax County are all in phase 1B, and that's on the slide in the middle there. You can see it includes people. Um, it actually, Gover Governor Northam actually changed it, I think, to include people ages, no, 65 and older is correct. That's correct on the slide there. And then if you have underlying medical conditions or if you're a frontline worker or what have you, those are the people that are included in the group now. And then as 1C rolls out, you know, other essential workers are gonna be included. Um, just so that we're all aware, phase 1B may last several months because again, the rollout's been a little slower than we had hoped. Um, so there's a lot of people still in, in phase 1B who have yet to be vaccinated. They're just in line to get their vaccine. So that may take a little bit of time. Um, good news, on January 29th, Johnson & Johnson released their data for their vaccine, which is a viral vector vaccine, so it's a different type of vaccine than the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines, it only needs one dose. Uh, their data showed that it was 72% uh, um, efficacious against COVID-19 in the United States, 66% in Latin America, and 50 7% in South Africa. And that is, again, because probably because of the mutation that we're seeing in that spike protein in those, in those other variants. So overall, in making sure that it's reducing the severe COVID-19 infection that people could get, it's, it's actually 85%. Um, so that is really similar to the flu vaccine. So oftentimes we tell people, even if you've had your flu vaccine, you can still get the flu, but it helps to make sure that you don't get so severely sick with the flu. So it's going to be the same with this vaccine uh, from Johnson & Johnson. My personal opinion um, is that this vaccine is probably going to be great for people who are low risk. Um, and so young people who don't have other medical comorbidities that aren't healthcare workers or in other high risk positions could easily take this vaccine. And then the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines could be reserved for people over the age of 55, people in the healthcare industry, et cetera, et cetera, who have more risks. So um, good news all in all, I think on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and hopefully we are rolling that out as, the, as you know, spring and summer come. All right. So let's talk a little bit about life after the vaccines. Um, we're not quite there yet, but I know a lot of people that have received their, their two doses of the vaccine are asking, so what can I do now? Can I go out to restaurants? Can I you know, go to the mall? What have you? For right now, we are recommending that everybody keep doing what we're doing. There's a lot of reasons for that. So keep social distancing, keep wearing your mask, keep washing your hands, don't touch your face, et cetera, et cetera. One is that immunity isn't achieved until after um, a one week after the second dose of your vaccine. So everybody has to keep in mind if you've had one vaccine or if you've just got your second vaccine yesterday, you are still not considered immune. And then keep in mind that the Moderna vaccine is 94.1% efficient and the Pfizer vaccine was 95%. So what that means is that five in 100 people will fail to um, build an, an enough of an immune response to the vaccine. So there is a 5% failure rate even when everything goes according to plan. So we wanna be really careful um, that we're still maintaining the social distancing and, and taking all of our precautions while we're still gathering that data, while we're still building herd immunity because that's gonna reduce your risk and everybody else's. Um, then there, the other thing is that there is some concern that people that have been vaccinated for COVID-19 may still be able to transmit COVID-19 even though they're not able to get sick themselves. That comes from a study of people that had actually had COVID-19 and developed natural immunity. This study found 
that even though they had natural immunity for themselves, they were able to spread COVID-19 to other people that had never had it. So we just don't have enough time yet with the vaccines. We just don't have enough data to know whether or not that's going to be the case uh, for the vaccinated people also. Hopefully it's not, but again, we need more time. So for right now, we're still going to mask up, social distance, wash our hands, do all the things that we're doing really well that we know how to do to reduce our risk. So as we move to the last slide, I just wanna tell you that I spent a lot of time on this slide. I know you can't tell by looking at it because it's quite plain, but I spent a lot of time thinking about what I wanted to say and it took a lot of personal reflection. And I really started to think about the fact that oftentimes when we've been through a trauma, um, we don't really appreciate the full effects of the trauma until that trauma has passed, until we're out of crisis mode, until we've had some time to kind of take a breath and reflect. So as vaccines roll out, as we reach herd immunity, as we learn about new variants, as the mortality rate continues to fall, as new treatments continue to be developed, and as we look toward uh, rebounding well, as Lindsay said, let us take full stock of how this crisis has touched each dimension of our wellness. So I think um, when I think about a, a return to a new normal, I think in terms of the dimensions of wellness as a hospice and palliative doctor, wellness is a really important concept to me and it's a very holistic concept. So it's not just your physical health, your intellectual health, uh, your social health, your spiritual well-being. it's all those things kind of together. And Lindsay touched on this a lot already, but you know, as we're thinking about you know, our, our hopeful plans for when more of us are vaccinated, for when we know the vaccines work against these new strains, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Let's think about the missed doctor's appointments that we've had, you know, slowly working back into our exercise uh, regimen so that we don't hurt ourselves trying to jump right back into it. Um, let's all be uh, cognizant and respectful of the effects of social isolation on our cognition. Um, that's, we, we know that that's the case. It's well studied. It's very well documented. We can't argue it affects all of us. Um, so if you're thinking about going back out into the world and you're thinking about, you know, you want to play cards again or play chess again, um, and you're kind of thinking, gosh, I don't even know if I remember, you're not alone. All of us are in that boat. Um, you know, if you're thinking, gosh, I'd really like to go see some friends or what have you, um, and it feels a little bit unnatural to be in a social situation and you're finding that you need some time uh, to work into it slowly, again, you're not alone. We're all in that, in that um, boat together. As far as our spiritual wellness goes, you know, sometimes a trauma can actually strengthen our, our spirituality and sometimes it can strain it, whatever it is. Let us be mindful, let us be patient, let us be kind to ourselves and to others as we kind of move toward the light at the end of the tunnel um, and squint in that bright light all together. And that's all I have. Thank you, Dr. Gloria. It is, it is truly amazing how far we've come in our knowledge of the coronavirus since our very first webinar in March. And it is a relief to everyone to finally be talking about a vaccine. So it's time now for some questions and answers. And um, so we'll, we'll get started with um, some of the questions that have been submitted. And your two guest speakers are back on camera so that they can answer those questions for you. And so um, let me pull one of those up. So let's see, this one it looks like uh, might be for Lindsay. Um, Lindsay, I hope to enter Goodwin House soon to become a resident. How will the vaccine be given to me if I have not yet received it? It's a very good question. And we are currently working with the Commonwealth of Virginia, the Department of Health to explore what will be the options, not only for Goodwin House, but for other senior living providers and healthcare providers to obtain the vaccine and be able to ensure vaccination for new residents that move into our community. So we know from the Commonwealth that their first priority has been to get the vaccinations out in an immediate fashion. And they have it come back to us with what would be the specific plan for when new residents move in, and let's say that could be in the summer. But they obviously are very well aware of the need for this, and we will keep our priority club members posted on what will be the approach to vaccinate new residents and, of course, new staff as they join the organization. Okay, thank you. 
And this one, it looks like is for Dr. Gloria. Does the efficacy rate decrease with age? And I assume we're talking about the vaccine here. That's a great question. In general, our immunity tends to wane as we age. Um, so you would think based on that knowledge that we have already, that the vaccine may be just a little bit less um, efficient in, in causing an immune response as we age. That being said, in the studies that, that Moderna and Pfizer did, they basically found that people in, in older generations were performing almost equally, it really wasn't statistically different to people that were younger, so. Okay, great. And this one I think is also for you, Dr. Gloria. Why has the case rate in the U.S. been so much higher than in other parts of the world? That's a very good question. And I think it's um, really multifaceted. I, I think that honestly, we were a little bit slow to um, put in restrictions and, and, and maybe take this as seriously as we, as we should have. Um, but I think that now that basically every area of the United States, I think they were just saying the other day that every single county in the United States has had at least one positive case of COVID-19. Um, I think, you know, all of us are, are now able to really take this quite seriously. And that's how we're seeing the downward trend um, that we are, so. Okay. Um, and this one I believe is for Lindsay. Lindsay, did any of your residents report vaccine side effects? Very good question. I'm so glad that that has been posed. So we have to date administered the first round of vaccines for all of our residents. That's healthcare or skilled nursing, assisted living, memory care, and independent living. And our residents in the higher levels of living have all received their second dose. So we now have literally over 1,000 doses and experiences from which to respond to this question. Also, if you include our staff members, many of whom and most of whom have received the second dose. And what we found was very, very little reaction to the first dose. A sore arm, which is what we would expect if we had the flu shot, for example. For the second dose, and we have had both the Moderna dose and the Pfizer dose across our organization, we have found that there have been a few more incidences of fatigue, a little bit sore arm for the second dose of the Pfizer vaccine. But in all instances, anyone that did have some type of reaction recovered fairly quickly, typically within 24 hours. Okay, great. Um, and it looks like this is for Dr. Gloria. For those of us outside of the Goodman House Life Plan communities, what are the best masks for us to wear and how can we get them? And I think this question probably is good for anybody regardless of where they live. Yeah, and we, we actually might get another question about double masking because, which maybe hasn't come yet, but that's also been in the news. So I'll address the double masking first briefly. Apparently Dr. Fauci had mentioned in an interview kind of off the cuff that he felt like double masking was a good idea. There have, no, there have not been any updates to guidelines from the CDC or any other of the big organizations um, so far about double masking, but the thought is just if you're wearing a cloth mask, if you were to put two cloth masks on, that would be better protection against these new variants, which are more contagious. My thought is that I really would rather see people wearing masks properly and consistently, not touching their face. You know, you can't wear the gator masks, for example, because it's only one uh, layer of fabric thick. So as long as you're wearing a fabric mask that is made of a cotton blend and is at least two layers thick, I think you're fine. The best mask that you can get your hands on um, as, as a private citizen is probably gonna be a surgical mask, which you can sometimes find on Amazon or at medical supply stores. Honestly, they're not always available because sometimes the stock runs out, but if you can find them, and sometimes you can these days, um, the surgical masks are probably the best thing. Right, right underneath that is gonna be, like I said, a good cloth mask that fits you well, that's at least two layers thick of a, of a cotton blend material. I think that as these new more contagious variants come out, um, mask makers are gonna, are gonna learn that they need to put another layer in their mask. And so I think we're gonna start seeing some better fabric masks available commercially too. Okay, and as a follow-up question to that, Dr. Gloria, uh, I know that many of us see people wearing their masks 
below their nose so that only their mouth is covered. And you did mention wearing the mask properly. So I wonder if you could just remind us about what, what proper really means. Yeah, so proper means that the mask is fitted above your nose and comes you know, below your chin to cover your mouth. Your, your mouth and nose should be covered completely and the mask should be tight enough fitting that there's not large areas of gap around your nose and mouth. Okay, great. And um, post-vaccine, um, here's a question. If I receive the second Pfizer shot in early February, would you consider it safe to travel by plane in mid-March? So if you if there that much time has gone by since your second vaccine, then technically you would be quote unquote considered immune. And that is again, as long as you're not in the 5% of people that unfortunately didn't build for whatever reason an appropriate immune response, that does not uh, tell us whether or not you can still spread COVID-19. So if you're going to see your loved ones and you get on a plane and you know you're carrying it, you may not get sick and but you're but you may get other people sick. So there's those kinds of things to consider. And that's exactly why we haven't changed any of the guidelines just yet. All of us are so anxious to be able to get out there and travel and see our families. Um, but we just don't have enough information yet to really answer the question as to how much risk there is involved in that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, this one I think is for Lindsay. Um, what is the best way to obtain the vaccine as we are both over 65? We have tried several websites, but have been canceled out. And this is something we hear a lot of. Right. And Sue, this goes back to the comments that both Dr. Glory and I have made that the state of Virginia has changed its approach and the organizations that it's using to distribute the vaccine. And that's not unusual. Other states have experienced that as well, but it has made it more bumpy and less consistent in terms of knowing who to reach out to to obtain the vaccine. Because originally it was through the hospital systems. And then in late January, the hospital system sort of said, stop, we're putting the brakes on and we're not going to schedule any more vaccinations. And then the local health departments really emerged as the primary conduit for organizing the distribution of vaccinations across cities and counties. And they remain in that role. So we encourage older adults to visit the health department website for their locality. And if it's in Alexandria, it's gonna be the city of Alexandria. If it's Fairfax, it'll be the Fairfax County Health Department. If it's in Arlington, it's the Arlington County Health Department. That's where you're gonna obtain the most up-to-date information on the vaccination options. Longer term, we will see, and this is what the experts report, that the distribution of the vaccinations is similar to the seasonal flu. It becomes very retail. We're all accustomed to going to the Minute Clinic at CVS or our local Walgreens and being able to obtain the flu vaccination. That's the longer term strategy. We're not quite there yet. Again, please go to the website for your local health department. Most of them have very active call centers and phone lines. So if you're more comfortable being on the phone and speaking to someone, almost all of them have made that option available. Okay, great, thank you. Um, now, as Katie mentioned at the very beginning of today's webinar, um, we are recording this webinar for the second time due to some technical difficulties. And so some of the answers to our questions have changed given that a week has gone by. And this next question is an example of just that. Um, and the question is, and this is for Lindsay, um, how will Goodwin House at Home members get the vaccine? And we do have an update on that. We indeed have an update on that, Sue. We are so thankful that the Department of Health for Virginia and CVS were very supportive in our advocacy to vaccinate Goodwin House at Home members. We had our first clinic for Goodwin House at Home members on Monday, February 1st. Yes, it was a snowstorm. No, it did not deter us. No, it did not deter the Goodwin House at Home members. And we were able to vaccinate them on our campus at Goodwin House Alexandria. That was their first dose. We were also able to vaccinate members of our priority club who are planning to move in, have almost started to, to back out of the driveway to move in, 
or will be moving into one of our communities soon. So in all, we were able to vaccinate over 150 additional members of the Goodwin House family yesterday. So that's an update on Goodwin House at Home members. Other Goodwin House at Home members were able to obtain the vaccine through one of the hospital systems when they were still offering them. Great, thank you. Um, and I think you did touch on this, Dr. Gloria, during your presentation, but I think this, this may bear uh, repeating. The question is related to anaphylactic re reactions to the vaccine. Um, now that millions of people have had the vaccine, is there an update on the number of anaphylactic reactions? Yeah, so like I said, the number of anaphylactic reactions is similar to that of, of the flu. So it's actually quite uncommon. It's a serious reaction. So it's something that we want to always be careful about. And that's exactly why they have you wait 15 to 30 minutes after you've had your vaccine um, so that they can monitor and make sure that you don't have any kind of allergic reaction to it. But it's not been any more than, say, the flu vaccine or any other medication that you might have a reaction to. And it is specifically a component of the vaccine. Um, it's not the vaccine itself. It's part of, it's actually uh, the polyethylene glycol or polysorbate. It's, so it's one of the ingredients in the vaccine itself. Okay. And um, we've been talking a lot about the, the two companies that are providing the vaccine right now, Pfizer and Moderna. And the question from this participant is, can one get a first shot in one location and then the second shot in another? That's an excellent question. So the you can get uh, shots in different locations as long as it's the same vaccine manufacturer. So if you get a Pfizer shot first, you need to have a Pfizer shot second, same with Moderna. The reason for that is because there have not, never been any studies in what happens when you mix the two vaccines. So we have no idea if you would actually be able to make an immune response if you got both. So if you get Pfizer first, you gotta stick with Pfizer no matter where you get it, same with Moderna. Great, and it sounds like from the comments that you were making earlier, Dr. Gloria, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which will be out soon, kind of eliminates that issue because it's a one-shot vaccine, is that right? That's correct. Okay, excellent. So here's another one. This is a take on a, on a similar question. I have received my second shingles vaccine on January 20th, when is it safe for me to receive the COVID vaccination? Another good question. The current recommendation from the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immuno Immunology is uh, 14 days between vaccines. Okay, so just a two week waiting period. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Um, is there thought that this vaccine may cause damage to vital organs, heart, kidneys, lungs, et cetera? Yeah, kind of like I mentioned earlier, we have not seen any evidence that it's causing damage to organs. Okay. All right, great. Well, that is really um, a summary of the many questions that we did get. They all covered many of the same topics, and I think that we have answered all of those questions. So um, given that, I would just like to thank all of you for attending our webinar today. We do have some upcoming webinars and you can see those on your screen. Um, we hope that you will join us on um, both February the 12th and the 17th and the 25th. You will be receiving invitations to those. Um, now that we have created another recording of our most recent webinar, we will be sending that to all of the participants as well as a copy of the PowerPoint slides that our speakers did use today. And you'll be receiving that via email in the coming days. So um, thank you very much. If you'd like any additional information about Goodwin House, we encourage you to call or email us. Um, we'll leave this information on the screen for a few minutes so you can jot it down if you would like to. Thank you for joining us. Please stay safe and engaged. This concludes today's webinar.